This is DW News Live from Berlin. Is another anti-immigration party about to shake up European politics? Swedes are going to the polls today with the far-right Sweden Democrats poised to make major gains. What does it mean for the country's liberal alliance? We'll have analysis from our correspondent in Stockholm. Also coming up. North Korea commemorates the 70th anniversary of the country's founding, but behind the pomp and the parades, does Pyongyang really have cause for celebration? We'll put that question to an expert on East Asia. I'm Helena Humphrey, glad you could join me. Voting is underway in Sweden in one of the most unpredictable elections in decades. The centre-left government faces a serious challenge from the far right, which has made major gains on the issues of immigration and integration. Well, Prime Minister Stefan Löfven cast his ballot earlier this morning. He's called this election a referendum on Sweden's welfare state. Polls suggest the populist Sweden Democrats could emerge as one of the strongest forces in Parliament. And the rise of the anti-immigrant party could shake up the status quo in a country known for its stability and liberal values. It's shaping up to be one of the most significant elections in Sweden's history. The first nationwide vote since the country took in more migrants per head of population than any other European country back in 2015, at the height of the migration crisis. It's just one key issue, along with healthcare, education and climate change. But in rural communities like here in Salzburg, migration has become a prism through which everything else is viewed. DW correspondent Barbara Wesel is at a polling station in Stockholm. Good to see you, Barbara. Another anti-immigrant populist party on the rise. How strong can we expect them to emerge on this election day in Sweden? We don't really know, Helena, because the polls have been veering all over the place during the last days. Uh, a week ago or two weeks ago, uh, some polls saw them at 25 percent, even in first place uh, in the S Swedish uh, political landscape. But then it seems to have gone down again. Now they are being polled with around 20 percent, which would put them in second place uh, in the Swedish uh, parliament. Uh, but we have to wait how strong their support really is when people go to the polls. Behind us, we see a polling station in the centre in the old town of Stockholm and what you see here are representative of all the big parties only. The Social Democrats aren't here and even the Sweden Democrat rep is also here and uh, they're still shoving uh, leaflets into people's hands and trying to change their minds at the very <laughs> last moment. So we have to wait and see the prognoses are simply not really firm and uh, we can't really dare uh, to make prophecies at this point. Barbara, how right-wing are the Sweden Democrats? What more can you tell us about them? It is a problem that lies in their past because they have come from a neo-Nazi party, a fr real fringe, extreme right-wing fringe party that used to exist in Sweden already in the 80s. But this was all, always sort of like an oddball little fringe thing. And then uh, when Jimmy Ockerson, who is now leader of this party, the Sweden Democrats, when he came, he tried to do what Marine Le Pen tried to do in France. He tried to sort of end, de-poison his party to to sort of de-demonize them. He says now, no, we are not an extreme radical right-wing party. Uh, we are not racists, even though they are pretty monothematic. I mean, they talk about nothing but migrants. They talk about crime. And it is really a tremendous amount of fear-mongering uh, that they sort of uh, using in trying to impress Swedish voters and giving them a feeling of insecurity in their own country, which, as we know from other countries, from Great Britain, from France, from Germany, even is what really sort of uh, fires uh, the populist vote and that's what's behind them so whether Jimmy Ockerson will really be successful with de demonizing the party and mm -hmm. showing and uh, sort of painting them as just another party even though a conservative one we will have to see uh, briefly if you wouldn't mind Barbara Sweden I mean it always had a fairly open refugee policy why is it such an issue now 
It has become an issue in 2015 when uh, around 150,000 refugees came in very quick succession at the height of the big crisis. And when the people had the feeling that the government had control over who comes and how many people come and how then they are integrated into society. It's a very similar uh, phenomenon uh, that, that you see in Germany and some other European countries. And then, of course, it's past mistakes uh, in uh, the refugee policy in Sweden here that has led to uh, this moment that politics in Sweden find themselves now in. They are really being torn apart and probably shaken all over the place. DW correspondent Barbara Wesel in Stockholm. Thank you. Now to some of the other stories making news around the world. First responders say four civilians have been killed by airstrikes in Syria's rebel-held Idlib province. Monitor groups say Syrian and Russian jets conducted more than 60 air raids on Saturday, the most intense bombing in weeks. Russia, Syria and Iran are believed to be preparing for a final assault on Idlib despite international pressure. Police in Greece have fired tear gas at protesters in the northern port of Thessaloniki. Demonstrators oppose a June deal to end a name dispute with neighbouring Macedonia. Under the plan, that country would change its name to northern Macedonia. Greece fears territorial claims on its own province named Macedonia. Environmentalists are deploying a huge boom in an attempt to clean up the world's largest rubbish patch in the Pacific Ocean. The 600-metre-long structure will be towed to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, an island of plastic waste twice the size of Texas. Organisers hope to remove half of the garbage over the next two years. North Korea is celebrating its 70th birthday. A month-long programme of events kicked off with a concert followed by a huge parade. While the communist state showed off some of its latest military hardware and best trained units, there was no sign of advanced long-range missiles. The focus was on civilian efforts to build the economy, the top priority for leader Kim Jong-un. Today's parade comes at a sensitive time. Kim's relations with US President Donald Trump have deteriorated since their June summit. And for more now, I'm joined in the studio by Bernhard Bartsch, an expert on China and North Korea from the Bertelsmann Foundation. Good to have you with us, Mr Bartsch. Now, good morning. Some experts say that, you know, the focus on this year's parade was the economy and not on military might, as we've seen previously. Um, is that how you read it? Yes, you're right. And it's interesting in a way that North Korea holds a military parade in order to showcase its economic goals. But I think the two most significant things that we saw there was that they did not showcase their most advanced weapons. And the second thing, the presence of Li Jianshu, who is the number three in the Chinese um, leadership hierarchy. And that is a sign that North Korea may be heading down a similar way like China, going for economic reforms, a bit of opening up. That's at least um, a hope that, that we see now. And I suppose the question as well, not showing the latest military hardware in that, in that way, was that a message then to the United States? Because, of course, diplomacy appears to have stalled with the United States for now. Can we expect further progress? I think we can expect a lot of activity, not a lot of progress, though. But the US and North Korea have really shot off all their diplomatic fireworks at the big summit in June in Singapore. So the expectations there were extremely high and they cannot be met. I think the much more significant diplomatic event that we're looking at now is the meeting with the South Korean president. Uh, what can we expect to come out of those talks? I think South Korea is really trying hard to bring in North Korea, to engage them economically, just as the Chinese are doing. And the big question in South Korea is, are they going to propose a peace treaty at some point? I don't think we're going to see this at the summit this month, but I think there's a strong political will in South Korea to offer more to North Korea, just, just to bring them in from the cold. I mean, you mentioned the fact that they're going to try and potentially engage South Korea economically. Is there the sense that North Korea at 70 really needs to do that for the, for the state of the nation and the situation that the people find themselves in there? It absolutely does. 70 years of North Korea 
is a celebration for the Kim family because they've hung on to power for 70 years. There's not that many regimes worldwide that have managed to do that, Saudi Arabia mainly. But um, for the people, it's a horrible situation. It's nothing to celebrate 70 years of North Korea. North Korea is in an area where every country around them has really developed and they haven't, although they have all the chances and we hope that we'll see some development there. Bernhard Bartsch, an expert on China and North Korea from the Bertelsmann Foundation. Thanks for your insights. Thank you. Tennis now and at a dramatic final at the US Open in New York, Naomi Osaka has beaten Serena Williams to claim her first ever Grand Slam title and the first for a Japanese woman. Osaka cruised into a first set lead. Williams took control early in the second set but then lost her cool, smashing her racket on the court after she was penalised when the chair umpire spotted her coach making hand signals. Williams called the umpire a liar and a thief and was promptly given a game penalty for verbal abuse. Osaka remained calm to take the set and the match. Oscar-winning director Alfonso Cuaron's film Roma has won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. The black and white drama has been hailed as his most personal film and his best. The Netflix release beat 20 other entity entries rather to claim the top award. And that's the latest here on DW. For more, do head over to our website, that is dw.com. I'm Helen Humphrey in Berlin. Thanks for your company and see you again soon.